It is my pleasure to welcome my friend Jason Scott to the show, and he is the author of several books, including Recession Proof Real Estate Investing, and uh, the topic could not be more relevant today. Now, the thing I want to tell you is this, and this is actually what makes today a very interesting uh, segment, I I believe, is that... uh, Jason wrote this book before the pandemic, and the presentation we're about to go through, if you're looking at the YouTube channel, if you're not, and you're listening to audio only, we'll describe the visual aids to you. So uh, you can always go back to my YouTube channel and reference them there, but I think you'll have a good description just with audio only. Uh, We'll try to do our best on that. But um, this is prior to the pandemic. And what's interesting about it, and I think Jason will concur, is that we all were already headed for a significant shift in the economy. And interestingly, uh, from a political perspective, I think the pandemic kind of gives the administration cover because it was going to happen anyway. Jason, welcome. What do you say to that? Hey, thanks, Jason. I really appreciate it. Glad to be here. Uh, Yeah, absolutely. I I've been giving this presentation in one form or another for about a year now. Uh, Like you said, I wrote the book, Recession Proof Real Estate Investing, about a year, year and a half ago. Um, Not necessarily just because I saw a recession coming, um, but because I thought it was important for us as real estate investors or any type of investors to really understand how economic cycles work, how economies in general work, um, and how changes in economics, changes in economies and and changes in economic cycles impact us as investors. A lot of us, if we started investing after 2008, um, have basically for the last 10 years have just seen the markets, every market, whether it's real estate, whether it's the stock market, whether it's the credit markets, basically just move in one direction Mm -hmm. up. And so for a lot of us, either as new real estate investors or real estate investors that, um, that weren't really paying attention in 2008, we only see one phase of the market cycle. And as we're getting closer, as we were getting closer over the last year towards uh, uh, an inevitable downturn, I just thought it was really important that investors start thinking about the other phases and thinking about how they should be changing up their, their strategies and their tactics so that during different phases of the cycle, they can continue to optimize their profits. And most importantly, they can continue to reduce their risk because during downturns during even the, the the more stable or flat parts of, of the economic cycle, typically the bigger risk isn't lower profits. It's just higher risk. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's the risk of, of real sizable losses if the market changes out from under us. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's dive in. I can't wait to look at yeah. uh, some of the some of the stuff on 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 the presentation. So let's dive into this. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll go through this quickly because, again, not all of this relates to where we are today. This was this was pre-pandemic, but I think it still is very um, – it's very pertinent to what we're discussing today, and it gives some context around what's going on today. I, so, I think so too, Jason. I, I couldn't agree with you more, and that's why I, I said that at the beginning, and I, I wanted you to present this presentation because, folks – you know, if you look at all of the signs that were going on, you know, the repo market, the yield curve, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and, and, and just the Austrian business cycle, we were due for a shift. You know, things do not, a boom does not last forever. Everything has a cycle. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's like Ecclesiastes from the Bible. There's nothing new under the sun, okay? Uh, and you, you, can't, you can't go for 12 years without, uh, without seeing a shift. So let's, yep. let's do it. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to do a five second who I am. Um, sure. So I am a real estate slash business guy. I started in real estate about 12 years ago. We've done about 60 million in transactions, everything from flipping to new construction, multifamily rentals, notes. Um, written four books on the topic. And uh, for anybody out there that's interested in the business side of things, and as a real estate investor, you are a business owner. Uh, my wife and I are co hosts of the Bigger Pockets business podcast. So check that out. Okay. Um, let's see. First question people ask is, so why do I care about economic cycles? Why do I care about the economy? I'm a real estate investor. Um, Why do I need to understand the stock market and yield curves and bond market and all these other things? Um, Because I'm just a real estate investor. And the answer is, it's important for a lot of reasons. First of all, the economy affects real estate. So a lot of us think that 
that we think back to 2008 and we think, okay, in 2008, like real estate kind of drove the, the economy mm-hmm. down into the ground. But historically, that's not the case. Historically, um, the economy is, is, I wouldn't say independent from real estate, but the economy isn't driven by real estate. But even so, the economy affects real estate. <clears throat> Even if we're not in a, a 2008 type situation where the real estate market is collapsing, if the economy starts to falter, people are losing their jobs, they're, they're seeing their wages cut, they're seeing their hours cut. And when people are making less money, that affects how they're spending their money on real estate. That means they're buying less real estate. That means they're not able to, to put as much money into, into their rent or their mortgage. So they're downgrading their real estate. They're not doing as much in terms of renovations or buying new, newly renovated properties. So the economy, even if it's not driven by real estate, it's going to always affect real estate. Second, real estate tends to be a lagging indicator, which means that the economy does a bunch of stuff. And then three, four, five months later, we start to see that effect from the economy ripple into the real estate markets. Right. So a lot of people today, and this is really interesting, a lot of people today are saying real estate's still still strong. I'm seeing prices rise in my area, mm-hmm. or I'm seeing uh, absorption rates drop in my area. Uh, I'm sorry, increase in my area. And so a lot of people aren't seeing the real effects of of this this economic breakdown in their real estate market yet. Right. And, and, and if I may, Jason, let me absolutely. mention add on to that. So real estate is a lagging indicator. You're absolutely right, but real estate data is also a lagging indicator, meaning that, you know, you get the data on the stock market instantly. You know, if a stock is up or down, you know that in real time. Exactly. In real estate, you're looking at 60 days plus because, exactly. uh, you know, there's there are many, many indices, of course. There's uh, the, the pending home sales, which I'm glad they created that several years ago because that really helped. Uh, but, but when you look at the recordings, you know, think about it. Someone does a real estate deal today, uh, maybe Maybe they close it in 45 or 60 days. And then that recording of that deed, that data needs to be aggregated. And, you know, it it just it's and then and then it needs to be uh, uh, synthesized and then it needs to be published. So there's a long time in the data lag, not just the activity lag. So you yep. you address the activity lag. And I'm just saying the data lag is even further. So, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, real estate, it, it's a long transaction cycle. Right. A, stock, yeah. a stock sale, the transaction instant. cycle is, is instant. Yeah. Right, right. Um, we, which, by the way, uh, and I'll just mention one more thing, is, is one of the reasons I actually love real estate. You know, the stock market people will tell you, well, you know, they don't like real estate because it's illiquid. And, you know, with their stock portfolio, they can go and log on to their account and trade it with a mouse click. Well, okay, great. But that's the reason your stocks are so volatile. That The reason I love real estate is because it's slow to react. It gives us time to think. It gives us time to plan. It gives us time to make rational, hopefully, <laughs> decisions. And, uh, and, uh, and, and you don't have that volatility because of its, its uh, you know, it moves like molasses, right? It's, it's just yeah. a slower. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And, and in formal economic terms, we refer to real estate as a somewhat inefficient market right. as opposed to stocks, which is a very very in, which is a very efficient market. Yeah, right. And typically, money can be made in an inefficient market a whole lot easier yes. than it can be made in an efficient market. Absolutely. So, absolutely. So and, and Jason, it's fair to uh, just address, and I, I know we got to move, uh, but why is that? Because the imperfection and the inefficiency in the market allows people who kind of know what they're doing to pick up good deals to add value. You know, you can't, you can't buy, uh, you know, your Apple stock and, and, you know, decide to put a new coat of paint on it and get your broker to do better marketing and sell it for more than it's worth. It will only sell for the list price, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The two big things that drive market efficiency are one, the number of buyers and sellers. And in a typical real estate market, maybe in New York City, you have enough buyers and sellers that you get a more efficient market. But in a typical area or a typical uh, farm area, let's call it, um, the number of buyers and sellers is relatively small. So unlike in the stock market, where literally you might have millions of people, including robots, that are trading on on, uh, a per second basis, in real estate, you have a relatively small number of buyers and sellers. So that's the first thing that drives that inefficiency in the real estate market. 
market. The second thing that drives the inefficiency in the real estate market is the difficulty of knowing the real values. Right. Because there are fewer transactions in real estate, it's harder to tell, is this house worth $100,000 or $120,000 or $80,000. And a lot of that is going to be subjective. A lot of that is going to be based on, like you said, data that is not accurate, data that might be 30 or 60 days stale, Mm -hmm. as well as emotional uh, context. People buy houses for emotional reasons. So a house might be worth $100,000, but if somebody really wants that house, they're going to pay $120,000 and and they're going to mess up the efficiency in the market. That doesn't happen in the stock market. Nobody's going to pay... $20 $20 for a $10 share of, of, of whatever stock um, because they are emotionally tied to that stock. So that, that's the other thing that drives inefficiency. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And when you when you sell your investment properties, you have two pools of buyers. You have investors, and you yep. also have those traditional home buyers, the owner-occupants that you mentioned. Okay, let's go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And so number three, the third reason why it's important to understand cycles um, is that understanding how cycles work is going to allow us to change up our strategies and our tactics, uh, which will allow us to maximize our profits, minimize our headaches, and most importantly, and I don't have this on here, but most most importantly, reduce our risk. As investors, that should be our number one goal. I mean, Warren Buffett says it best. Uh, rule number one in investing, don't lose money. Rule number two, don't lose money. <laughs> um, and so being able to, to minimize and mitigate our risks is really important. And understanding how the economy works can really help us do that. Absolutely. Okay. So real quick, what is an economic cycle? So we're starting to see this. Over the last 10 years, a lot of people have just seen the market move in one direction. But in reality, we all know, if not, if we don't think about it, we all know that the economy kind of moves in a cycle. It goes up, hits a peak, it goes down, hits a trough, and then it goes back up again. And this happens over, I mean, many, many times in, in a century. Um, in fact, um, and, and so the, the up parts we call the expansion, down part we call the contraction, et cetera. So we'll, we'll use expansion and contraction here. Um, but typically speaking, uh, this happens over and over and over again. So if we put back-to-back cycles together, we get something that looks like this. The economy goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down, and that repeats. Okay, but it doesn't really look smooth like this. And we've seen this. We've seen 2001 where we we saw a downturn. If you're paying attention, 2001, it wasn't that bad of a downturn. We saw 2008 and it was a major crash. We see 2020 and it's worse than even 2008 was based on the current numbers. So the, the cycle that we see isn't necessarily smooth like this. In fact, it looks more like this. And this is a graph of something we call gross domestic product or GDP. And this measures the total output in the economy. This measures the total number of transactions that are being done, how much people are buying, how much companies are selling. And typically, this one piece of economic data, what we call GDP or gross domestic product, is the single most valuable source of where we are in the economy. If we're doing more transactions, if we're doing bigger transactions, if the economy is growing, we say we're in an expansion. When those transactions slow down, when the transactions become smaller, when the economy just starts to contract, when we see negative growth in the economy quarter over quarter, we call that a recession or a contraction. And this is what it looks like over the past 60 or so years. You can see that that zero is the kind of the baseline, that 0% growth. If yeah. next year the economy produces the exact amount as it produced this year, we saw zero percent growth. We want to see more. We want to see growth. We want to see the economy producing more year over year. But obviously, that doesn't always happen. Those gray bars, by the way, are each of the recessions that we've seen over the past sixty years. Right. Right. So, and 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 you know, uh, just a side note on the GDP uh, metric. Uh, of course, uh, you know there are many debates about the way it's calculated, and uh, you know it things that skew it and so forth. Uh, So that notwithstanding, and of course, it changes over the years. And then the other question is to ask, compared to what? Well, compare it to other countries. And if you look at some of the, uh, you know, the big growth economies like China, of course, and India, uh, and, uh, you know, things have changed as we we all know. But, uh, you know, those economies 
have needed to grow much faster than ours because they're not mature economies. They're developing economies. And their population is so big that they've just got to have much bigger growth numbers. So if you were to look at a world chart and say, well, you know, India's had uh, upwards of 8% GDP growth sometimes. In the US, you know, their target is if they can grow it at 3%, they think they're doing pretty well. Uh, well, it, it's it's different, though. You know, so yep. just understand that. Okay. Okay, good. So um, so that begs the question, where are we in an economic cycle? <clears throat> Excuse me. Typically, there are three things we can look at to determine where we might be in the cycle. Now, today, we all know that we, we are in a major rough patch. We all know that. But leading into today, how would we have known exactly where we are? And the three things that economists like to look at, the three things that, that because economists like to look at, I like to look at, one is something we call timing. So we can actually use historical data of, of market change changes um, to predict future changes. History tends to be a good predictor of the future. Number two is observation, looking around us and just saying, hey, what do we see going on? How do we feel? How does this feel compared to other times? Very qualitative data, but that qualitative data can be very useful. And then third, the pure quantitative economic data. What is the economic data telling us? So going back, um, let's go back to the timing piece, going back to where we were in, let's say, January, back when there was a lot of discussion over, um, is the economy going to keep expanding for the next couple of years? Are we headed for a downturn? I know everybody disagreed on, on where the economy was headed. But from a timing perspective, it was pretty clear what was likely to happen. We don't know if it was going to be weeks or months or years, but it was pretty clear what was eventually likely to happen. So again, all those gray bars are the uh, are the downturns, the recessions. Um, this is kind of a smoothed out picture of, of what the economy's looked at look like over the past sixty years. Um, this is 60, 70 years. In that time period, we had eleven recessions. So you don't have to be great at math. The 70 divided by 11 is about six and a half, which means over the past 70 years, we have a recession. We have a downturn every six and a half years. So the fact that we were over 10 years, over 11 years into this current cycle that we've been in, we've seen an up economy for over 10 years, it shouldn't surprise anybody that just based on historical data, we were pretty close to the next recession. Again, it may have been months, it could have even been years, um, but we were closer to the next downturn than we were far away from it, just based on historical timing. So that's the first piece. And then if we look back over the last 160 years, um, we see that we actually have had 33 recessions. So it's actually closer to five or six years that, that we have a recession in this country. If you go back the full 150, 160, excuse me, 160 years. And this is where we were back in January. We were about 135 months into this current cycle. As you can see, that's the longest cycle we've ever been in. So nobody should be too surprised that we were, we were from a timing perspective, we were getting pretty close to, to a downturn. Jason, now, um, yeah. the two different colors on that last chart, can you yeah. uh, explain those? Yeah. Oh, yeah. so that's a really good point. So the blue is actually the contraction part of each okay. economic cycle. And the other is the time. And the and and the red is the expansion part. Oh, okay. so Got it. remember every every cycle has two phases. It mm -hmm. has that expansion, which is the up piece, and the contraction, which is the down piece. Okay. So the blue is the contraction, the red is the expansion. One of the things to notice is typically speaking, in a an a full economic cycle, again, we're talking six, seven years for the typical cycle, only a year or two of that tends to be the recession or the downturn. Typically in that six and a half years, four or five of those years tend to be the good part, the uptick, the expansion. So in a typical recession or a typical economic cycle, we're going to see 12, 18 months of downturn, and then that's going to result in another four or five years of, of, of expansion, Jason, which will then lead. Yeah, go yeah. ahead. Yeah. So so it, it's a good thing to note that even if we're at the beginning of the next cycle right now, historically speaking, it's probably going to last 12 or 18 months. Now, mm -hmm. every cycle is different. Doesn't mean this one's going to be just like the, the rest. Conditions are different now. But historically speaking, we would be looking at 12 to 18 months if this were kind of the beginning of the downturn. Mm -hmm. You know, now what what many people are probably thinking as they hear you talk about this is they're thinking uh, the standard thing. Well, I, this time I'm going to be ready. I'm going to scoop up assets at low prices. <laughs> I'm going to time the market, right? And his history has just proven that market timing just doesn't work very well in any 
category of assets, whether it be precious metals, real estate, stocks, the market timers just never really win uh, in any big way, you know. But what do you say to that? You know, it it seems when you look at these charts and you talk about them, it seems kind of simple, you know, like, okay, we're going to be in this recession, we're going to hit the hit the bottom of it about halfway through, maybe it's 12 months, 18 months uh, of sort of a down, not a technical recession, which is two consecutive quarters of flat or declining GDP. But, um, you know, what do you say to the market timers? That's really the crux of the question. Uh, um, so I like to break my investments, all of my assets, regardless of asset class, kind of into two categories. Mm-hmm. Um, one is the 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 strong assets, those that I feel are are good long term holds. They're they're throwing off cash flow, whether we're in a good market or a bad market. Those I'm going to hold, and my goal there is to dollar cost average, mm-hmm. meaning when the market goes down, I'm going to buy more. When the market goes up, I might buy less, but I'm going to hold everything because, like you said, it's hard to time the market, mm-hmm. and so for a good asset, there's no reason to try and time the market. If I have uh, a single family rental or a multifamily building right. that's throwing off a lot of cash flow, I don't care if that million dollar property Very goes down good. to $100,000 in value, yeah. if it's still throwing off cash flow, because right. I know 10 years from now, it's going to be worth more than a million again. Yeah. So if, if I have a cash flowing asset that I like, and that's throwing off a good amount of cash, I don't really care if the value goes up. I don't care if the value goes down because I'm not holding it for for the 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 sale value of the of the asset. I'm holding it for the cash flow. Value very 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 well said. I agree completely. So, yeah. The, if yep. you're a yield oriented investor and you've got the yield, who cares about the price? You know, this it's not like you need to sell this tomorrow to have lunch money or you know or to pay your own mortgage or rent you know this is this is your investment portfolio and you should be keeping it for the long term and just you know living off the yield okay good let's go um so Let's jump into uh, the economic data. So this is what we were looking at um, back in, um, in in January. So here are some of the things I like to look at. Here are some of the things that that uh, economists like to look at to kind of determine where we might be in a downturn. One, we talk about the yield curve, which is just the relationship of bond yields, short-term bond yields to long-term bond yields. Basically, bonds are, are um, IOUs that the government uh, issues to raise money. It, it's, it's basically a note, just like uh, a bank is creating a mortgage. The government is creating these notes where they're going to pay you interest um, to buy up debt. And typically, if you buy up shorter term debt, it's going to pay less than if you buy up longer term debt. If you're willing to hold a note from the government for 30 years, they're going to pay you more interest or yield um, than they will if you're only willing to hold it for a year. And so weird things happen with those interest rates uh, when the economy starts, when when investors start to get nervous and the economy gets to that point where it might be changing. So and, we like and thus we have the inversion yield curve, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. I've, everybody's probably at this point heard the, the term inverted yield curve. And that's an indication that the economy may be headed towards a change. Uh, we have a thing called the Buffett indicator, which is interesting. Warren Buffett is a big fan of this, which is why they, they named it after him. But basically, it's the ratio of the entire equities market, the entire stock market to the GDP of the country. And typically speaking, over the last 100 years, we see a very consistent relationship, um, a mean value of that relationship, somewhere around 0.9. So GDP is about 0.9. The total GDP in the country is about 90% of the stock market value. And so typically if we see the stock market go up and that ratio increase well above 90%, we can say that the stock market's overvalued. If the if the um, if the stock market goes down and goes well below that 90% ratio, that historically median indicator, um, we can say that the the stock market is is undervalued. And back in January, we were seeing a ratio of about 155%, meaning that the stock market was overvalued by about 50%. So a lot of economists were saying, based on this historical data, and again, history is a good indicator of the future, based on that, the true value of the stock market should be around 20,000, 19,000, 20,000 points for the Dow Jones. Um, and so when we got down to about 18, 19, 20,000, there were were a lot of uh, a lot of economists who were saying this is the right value. Now we're back up to around twenty four thousand. It'll be curious or be interesting to see what happens over the future in, in the near future. 
Um, then we look at the gross domestic product. Again, very good indicator of how the economy is doing right now. Business investment. So businesses tend to invest more um, when they are optimistic. When CEOs and CFOs are optimistic, they're investing more money. When they stop investing, it's because they see signs that, that disturb them. And when they stop investing, that actually impacts the economy. When, a, when big businesses stop investing, that hurts the economy. So business investment is something we want to look at to determine where the economy might be headed. Unemployment, obviously, is an important number when it comes to the, the, uh, the, the economy. Housing starts, basically, it's the same thing as business investment, but for real estate investors or real estate builders. So are builders starting to build more houses or are they getting concerned and they're slowing down? Um, foreclosure rate we want to look at, obviously, as that goes up, that's a that's an indicator that things might not be going well in the economy or that there are cracks. Uh, and the stock market. So again, stock market like real estate is a lagging indicator. A lot of times the stock market doesn't move until after the rest of the economy moves, but it's something we like to look at. And then finally, consumer sentiment. So are people confident? Are people optimistic? Are they spending money? When people stop spending money and start saying that they're not confident in the market, well, that's when things tend to start to turn. And Jason, you know, one of the things that I always uh, want people to remember is that, uh, the, and these are great indicators, by the way, uh, is that the housing market, as people refer to it, the talking heads on CNBC or wherever, right? You know, first off, they can't categorize the entire U.S. market as one housing market. Uh, that's, of course, the first thing. But the second thing is when people say the housing market, they're always referring to the prices of buying yeah. properties. They're not referring to the rental market. And if exactly. you're an investor, you know, these things, everything on here can be going poorly, yet your rental income can be doing great. Isn't that interesting? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And so just to recap, we have the yield curve, which is a um, a representation of what's going on with uh, treasury yields, so government debt yields. Uh, we have the Buffett indicator, which is a good indication of whether the stock market is overvalued or undervalued or correctly valued. Uh, gross domestic product, which is uh, the total output of the economy. Business investment, so how much businesses are spending, because remember, if businesses stop spending, uh, that actually can hurt the economy. So business investment isn't just a good indication of where we are in the economic cycle, but can also be a good indication of where we're headed. Unemployment numbers, obviously, housing starts, which is the number of new builds that are starting, foreclosure rate. Stock market, again, tends to be a trailing indicator, doesn't always tell us where things are, are headed, but but uh, can give a good indication of where things currently are. And consumer sentiment, which is basically just what are people thinking about the economy? So again, this presentation was originally created back in about a year ago, um, and I was updating it through the beginning of the pandemic, where we ended up, I guess, around the January, February timeframe, right before we hit the pandemic. And this is important because this gives us an indication of how strong the economy was leading into this, uh, this current economic event that we're in. So our yield curve last June, it did what was called inverted. So basically, uh, low term and midterm yields. So, uh, low, low, uh, short term expiration yields and midterm expiration yields were higher or were lower than long term expiration yields. Um, and when we see that typically what that means is that investors are start starting to get nervous. Um, they're moving their money out of short term investments into long term investments, pushing those yields down. Um, and so this is a good indication that really big investors, th those guys and gals with billions of dollars, uh, including other countries that invest in our debt, we're starting to get nervous about what was going on in the economy. Uh, Buffett indicator. So Buffett indicator was about 155%. Remember, we talked about around 90% is, is where we expect that value to be for the uh, for the stock market to be accurately priced. At 155%, this was an indication the stock market was about as overpriced as it's ever been in the history of this country by about as much as 50% or so. Uh, gross domestic product. Um, we were somewhere around 2% in Q4 of 2019, um, which 2%, don't get me wrong, 2% is historically about average. We should be happy with 2%. But given the tax cuts back in 2018, given the dropping of interest rates through 2019, we should have expected 
somewhat more of a boost in GDP. In fact, that was kind of the reason uh, we, we had those tax cuts, and that was the reason why we were lowering interest rates, to kind of spur the economy, hoping to get to 3 or 4% GDP. We were at 2%, which again, not bad, but not necessarily what we expected. Remember when we had that one stellar quarter where GDP was like 3.9% or so, and uh, Trump was bragging about it like crazy? Uh, that was uh, That was a pretty amazing... GDP for a U.S. for a mature economy like the U.S. Absolutely. Yeah. We don't typically see that. That was right after the tax cuts. Uh, there was a ton of money flowing out there. Businesses. So this actually goes into the next point, business investment. So right after that, uh, right after that tax cut, businesses were spending heavily. When businesses spend heavily, that boosts uh, that boost GDP for the whole country. Um, and businesses kind of after that first or second quarter after the tax cuts, businesses, they were still flush with cash. But instead of using that money to invest and grow their businesses, they started using that money to do stock buybacks, um, which is good for shareholders, not necessarily good for the economy. And so what we saw is after a year or two um, – of, of tax cuts for businesses, we started to see this business investment start to dwindle, which was really disappointing because it was kind of an un unintended consequence of, of this massive um, uh, windfall that all these these companies got. Yeah. So um, are, are you against, are you for or against <laughs> stock buybacks? Uh, you know, that's a hotly debated issue, uh, Jason. Uh, certainly, I am all for private industry having the right to do whatever they want with their money. Right. Um, the goal of private business owners is to do whatever they can to um, benefit their shareholders. Mm -hmm. That's the goal of business. As a business person myself, um, in some of my businesses, I have investors. And my sole goal in those businesses is to do the right thing by my investors. So I certainly don't fault businesses for doing the stock buybacks. Um, that said, um, the stock buybacks were, um, that, that all that money was made available by the government giving these tax incentives and these tax breaks. I would have liked to have seen some, some more definition around those tax breaks that kind of required businesses to spend more of that money in the economy to kind of do what mm -hmm. the goal of those tax breaks were, which was to spur the economy. Right. So, so I don't have any problem with, with uh, businesses using that money, whatever loopholes they can take advantage of to, uh, to benefit their shareholders. That's their job. Um, but I think that the government next time we do something like this should be a little bit more clear on what that money can be used for. And we're seeing those same arguments now with the, uh, with the stimulus packages. So five hundred billion dollars was was um, was released a few, I guess, weeks, months ago at this point, um, for business investment to kind of stimulate businesses and keep them afloat. Um, and there was a lot of discussion on what are the requirements for businesses to use that five hundred billion dollars? Could they use it for stock buybacks? Could they use it for big bonuses? Could they use it? What could they use it for? And so I think that's an important uh, discussion. And I think after two thousand eighteen, when we saw all those stock buybacks. Um, um, moving forward, it's going to be a big discussion anytime that we kind of hand money to, to big businesses now. Keep in mind, one of the downsides of those stock buybacks is that it generally increases corporate debt. And these days, we're at that highest levels of corporate debt than we've been in the history of this country, mm -hmm. which – is, is not good for the economy. Now, a lot of those businesses, if they were around in 2008, they saw that they were bailed out, especially the airlines, the hospitality industry, Wall Street um, firms. A lot of them got bailed out. And so perhaps they're not as concerned about business or corporate debt uh, as they should be, right. because they probably think they're that they're going to get They're bailed. too big to fail. And they they're probably will get bailed out. Look, they're getting bailed out now. I'm in the sense that, uh, you know, the biggest investor the human race has ever known, the Federal Reserve, yep. is buying up assets like crazy and it's helping them. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that I think that we, we are uh, misincentivizing big businesses yeah. at this point. And, and I'm a big fan of the free market. I'm a big fan of capitalism. Yeah. Um, and but, but any time. Yeah. Anytime we are um, we are bailing out big businesses, anytime um, we are helping them avoid um, negative impacts to their businesses, we're essentially intervening in that free market. Yep. And so um, a, a lot of times we think about the opposite of capitalism is when we're kind of giving money to the people. Mm -hmm. But what can be just as bad is when we're giving money to big businesses as well. We're the, not the, the, the lesson here, sadly, is 
be really irresponsible, grow <laughs> super fast, become too big to fail, and you'll get a bailout and pay yourself giant bonuses and you know, nobody can do anything about it. Yeah, yeah exactly, it's, it's exactly. It, but, it unlevels yeah, the playing field. Yeah, it it really basically does. puts small business owners on, on in, a, in a worse position. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, unemployment, again, this was back in January, February. Lowest unemployment in our history. Fantastic numbers. Now, you could argue that there were a lot of people that were underemployed. A lot right. of people had multiple jobs. Sure. Um, uh, this number isn't the only number. In fact, when you look at unemployment, there are actually multiple measures of unemployment. Yeah, right, right. Um, so, but, I, but, I, but the nice thing is it is a benchmark, right? It gives absolutely. you the relative number to what it was two years ago. I mean, they haven't changed the way they report for you know several years and if exactly. you look at if you look at like shadow stats i had john williams on the show the founder and i'm sure you know that website you know the real unemployment rate is much higher but it always yep. has been i mean for a long time Right? Exactly. So, so it's exactly. a benchmark. Yeah. Yeah, it's a benchmark, and certainly nobody can argue that 3.5 percent unemployment isn't fantastic. Yeah. Um, it, it meant that there were a lot of people in this country that who previously weren't working or or um, didn't want to be working that were now back in the workforce, right. which is a good thing. Yeah. Um, housing starts is, is again, that's the number of, uh, new construction projects starting from developers. That's kind of been all over the board. We saw a couple quarters back in 2019 where that had slowed down, but then towards the end of 2019, developers seemed to be pretty optimistic and they mm -hmm. were starting a whole lot of new builds all around the country. Um, so again, that, that number was all, all over the board, but leading into uh, this pandemic, uh, housing starts were actually really strong and, and developers seemed to be very confident. Foreclosure rate, slightly up, but let's be clear. When I say slightly up, um, we were up, I think, 9% at one point, but 9% up from the lowest numbers in history. Um, and so 9% increase on a tiny number really isn't that much. Um, so foreclosure rate was still super strong. <clears throat> Excuse me. People were people were secure. Um, people weren't particularly over leveraged. People were still making money. They were able to pay their mortgages. Um, so that number wasn't at all concerning. Stock market, we all remember, was was near thirty thousand uh, for the Dow Jones. And I mean, um, each of the markets was tremendously strong. That's a good indication of consumer sentiment, consumer confidence, um, which was again tremendously strong leading into January, February. Back in Q1 of 2019, Q2 of 19, we actually saw a dip in consumer sentiment. Um, there, there was some concerns. Uh, we saw some liquidity issues in, in some of the markets. Um, but overall, consumer sentiment has been pretty strong. And we saw that in the stock market. We saw that in consumer demand in retail. Um, so, if you were to look at all of this data kind of as a whole uh, back in January or February of this year, what we saw was a very, very mixed bag. There were certain indicators that were huh, leading us to believe that that we're probably end, nearing the end of the expansion phase of the cycle. Um, there were other indicators that were indicating everything was still really strong. And then there were a couple that were just kind of mediocre and, and, and weren't really indicating one way or another. Um, I like to say back in 2019 and, and the beginning of this year, um, is that we were kind of at the top of the market. Um, we had seen tremendous growth. We weren't losing that growth, but we probably were getting towards the end of the expansion. We weren't going to see a, a, a we weren't going to see a ton of additional growth, but we were likely at the top of the the economic cycle for the last six or twelve or eighteen months. Things were still strong. Things still looked good, even if we weren't going to see a ton of additional growth. We weren't starting to see much much contraction either. Everything was kind of we were we were kind of in in a stasis period um, where everything was just kind of holding steady at the top of the market. And the question was, were we going to stay at the top of the market for another two months or another two years? And nobody really had any idea. So then this pandemic comes along and um, – and here we are. This is this is the cycle again. I, I think that uh, January, or February of this year, we could say we we're really right at the top of that peak. Where I see us now is somewhere around here. Now, if you just look at the economic numbers, if you just look at the unemployment data, if you look at GDP data, if you look at retail spending, obviously we're worst numbers in the history of this country. But most of that is artificial. Most of that is a result of the government forcing businesses to shut down, forcing people to stay in their houses forcing people not to work. Um, 
at some point very soon, hopefully the next couple of weeks, at least, uh, or at worst, the next couple of months, we're going to see things open up. We're going to see people go back to work and we're going to see the, the economy kind of get much closer to where we were in January or February this year. Now, I don't think we're going to get back to the peak. We're not going to get back to where things were in January or February. We're not going to get back to 3.5% unemployment. We're not going to get back to 2% GDP. But we're not going to be at negative 25% GDP. We're not going to be at 25% unemployment, the numbers that we're seeing now. Again, artificial numbers that we're seeing now. But I think when we get back, what we're going to find is that we've kind of – found ourselves at the beginning of a true recession. I think in a couple months we're going to look we're going to look at the numbers and we're going to see unemployment in the 6 7 8 9 10% range, which is typical recessionary numbers. We're going to see GDP at zero, maybe negative 1%, maybe negative 1.5% typical recessionary numbers. I think we're going to see ourselves kind of at the beginning of the next downturn, the beginning of the next recession. Now, what's going to happen from there? Are we going to continue to go it, down? It's funny. It's funny. You're saying, um, you know, we're, we're in a recession now and we're yep. going to, we're going to wake up into a recession. <laughs> it's kind of an odd. I mean, I mean, you could argue we're in a depression now, but there's no yeah. real academic definition for depression. So yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, and again, I think uh, throughout the history of this country, we, we normally look and we determine where we are in the cycle mm -hmm. based on economic data. And right now that economic data is, is really, it's, it's just, it's meaningless. And as somebody who, who is, is a diehard um, adherent to economic data, it's hard for me to say that, but it, it's so true that you just uh, at some point uh, in the future, we're going to see economic uh, uh, tables with asterisks next to yeah, uh, all, I know. all the data know. from now. This uh, is this is a black swan. Yeah, exactly. Right. Well, Nassim Taleb actually says it's a white swan. In other words, we knew it was coming yep. uh, someday, but we just didn't know when. Yeah. Absolutely. And and um, if, if you haven't read the book, for all your listeners, uh, speaking of Nassim Talab, oh, he's great. Um, yeah. uh, Anti-Fragile yeah. is a fantastic yeah. book. But, but you know what the one I love is Skin in the Game. Because, Skin in the Game because is that, fantastic Because that well. just shows you, you know, all of these people. Jason, one of the things I, I teach my audience is uh, these 10 commandments of successful investing. And number three has resonated without a doubt with people better than any, and it is thou shalt maintain control. In other words, be a direct investor. That's why we both love real estate, right? Yep. Because you buy it, you own it. It's not a fund. You know, it's just you, 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 do, you make the decisions. It's your thing. Of course, a little more responsibility comes with that. But, you know, the, the Nassim Taleb book, Skin in the Game, really, it, 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 it just exposes all of these banksters and all of these other, uh, you know, essentially criminals, but they're not legally criminals necessarily. Yep. Sometimes they are. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but I say they're criminals just by my definition who, you know, they, they just give fake advice. They have no skin in the game. Uh, they, they, they don't, you know, practice what they're preaching at all. Uh, it's, it's a great book. Yeah. Really yeah. good. Yeah. Nassim Taleb is great because he's a rebel. I, I love him. I love him. Yeah. Yep. And, and I'm certainly not giving investing advice. I'm not telling other people what they should do or not do. But for me, that's the reason why for the last 12 years, I haven't had a single penny in the stock market. Mm -hmm. um, I, I like that control of my investments. Yeah. And, and I like those asset classes where I'm making the decisions. Yeah. Um, and if my investments go south, it's because of bad decisions I've made. If my investments do well, it's because of good decisions my team and I have made. So, right, absolutely. right, right, right. You know, when you don't maintain control, you leave yourself susceptible to three major problems. Number one, you might be investing with a crook. I mean, we're all familiar with all the scandals on Wall Street, right? And yep. and, and everywhere else. I mean, there's scandals everywhere. Uh, number two, you might be investing with an idiot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Either way, you're going to lose money. And number three, assuming they're honest and competent, they take a huge management fee off the top for managing the deal. And exactly. and it's disproportionate to what you get. You know, it's it's ridiculous. Yeah. And what I would what I would suggest for anybody out there who is is thinking about that whole point of taking a huge management fee, learn about how the uh, the the uh, return um, metric uh, internal rate of return IRR works. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what you'll what you'll find is when you take out money at the beginning of an investment, um, it has a much 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 greater impact on the returns of that investment um, than if you take out that money at the end of the investment. And meaning, the fact that, meaning if you take it out early, the IRR goes down. 
Exactly. Because of transaction costs, though, right? Exactly. And when you're paying fees, management fees on an annual basis, um, you are destroying your returns. Right, right. That's why hedge fund managers make so much money. Look at folks, two and 20 may not seem like that much money, but when you really do the math on the two and 20 equation, I encourage you to research this. When James Altucher's been on my show a couple of times, you know, he he was a hedge fund, hedge fund manager, and uh, you know we talked about that two and twenty rule, and he did the math on it, and it's it just eats up your returns. It's an, it's yep. incredible, and and IRR that Jason mentions internal rate of return, that's really the holy grail of investment calculations. Okay, so uh, check that out. You know, we've got other resources where we've discussed IRR, but yeah, go ahead. Good. Yeah. Here, here's the easiest way to think about that. Let's say you have $100 and you lose 30% of that. Um, either you lose it or it's taken out. You now have $70. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the conventional wisdom is common sense would say, well, if that, that money now grows 30%, you're back to your $100. <laughs> no, you're not. But that's not that's not the case. <laughs> yeah. uh, you were at 70. If you now grow 30%, you're back to $91. Right. So so a loss of 30% before a gain of 30%, you're going to you're going to end up in the negative. So yeah. um, the, the goal is to always gain the money first. Yeah, absolutely. Good yeah. stuff. Okay. Okay. So, so I think we're about here. Uh, once things rebound, I think we're going to see ourselves at the beginning of a typical recession. Nice thing about recessions are if you look at the total cycle economic cycle, typical again, cycle lasts five, six, seven, eight years. Um, most of that cycle is going to be in the expansion phase. Typically speaking, the recession or down turn part of, of the economic cycle is the shortest part of the cycle, 6, 12, 18 months. So if we really are about here, I think it's likely that in 6 or 12 or 18 months, we're heading back up that recovery side and, and things are getting good again. That said, I think that this particular downturn comes with a number of risks that we haven't seen in previous downturns. Hey, tell and us so about while that. I think yeah. we could be towards the bottom of that curve in six or 12 months, I think it's possible that we don't necessarily start to see the recovery after that. Um, keep in mind that the government, the Federal Reserve, the Treasury is injecting literally trillions of dollars into the market right now. And if you think of that number in terms of our total money supply, so the total amount of money kind of floating um, around our, our economy is somewhere around, well, a couple months ago, it was somewhere around 14 or $15 trillion. So if you want to get technical, that's called the M2 money supply. Um, and that's kind of the total amount of, of cash and credit floating around our economy. Um, we're adding three Five, it could get up to seven or ten trillion dollars to our economy over the next few months. That will literally increase the money supply by twenty-five or fifty percent. That's a huge number. So the magic question is inflation. I mean, uh, quite, it, that's with a question mark. Yeah, <laughs> inflation. And, and, and here, here's the thing: um, certainly, inflation is a risk longer term. Keep in mind that that a lot of people think you print money, you get inflation. Mm-hmm. Well, if you print money and you have a lot of demand and, and a strong economy, that's a recipe for inflation. When you don't have a lot of demand, it's hard to gain inflation. Inflation occurs when everybody wants to buy stuff and businesses to keep up with all that demand, they have to start hiring more workers and buy more inventory and build more warehouses and buy more equipment. And when they buy all that stuff, they then have to pass the costs off off to somebody, they end up passing the costs off to us by raising prices. So that's inflation. When there's no demand there, businesses aren't hiring. They're not buying inventory. They're not buying uh, warehouses. They're not buying equipment. And so we're not going to see inflation. So I don't think inflation is a risk in the short term because we're not going to see a lot of demand during a downturn. But as soon as the recovery starts and as soon as people start spending money again and people start making more money, uh, at that point, I think we do have a big risk of inflation. Mm -hmm. Now, the interesting thing is you go ask 10 economists, 10 really smart people that should know what they're talking about, whether they think there's a risk of inflation. You're going to get a third of them who say, yeah, inflation is, is the biggest risk here. You're going to get another third of them who say, no, I don't think there's any inflationary risk here. I, I think we're, we're OK, given where interest rates are and a number of other things that kind of impact inflation. But then you're going to get the last third of those who actually say, not only am I not worried about inflation, I'm worried about deflation. And for those that aren't familiar, deflation can be just as bad for an economy 
as inflation. So oh, worse. I mean, de- deflation is is the boogeyman. Inflation is bad, but deflation is really bad. I mean, yep. that's that's why you know, Jason. I, I've always taught um, you know our audience to just align your interest as an investor with the two most powerful forces the world has ever known, governments and central banks. And, uh, you know, their business plan is inflation. And, you know, they they may not always achieve their business plan. No business does. But overall, they're going to achieve it. You know, right, right. I mean, I I don't know. Maybe you disagree. We haven't really talked about this. But um, but I, I think the future has to be inflationary and uh, you know, a lot of a lot of deflation bugs out there say, uh, well, you know, they can't stop it. Well, sure they can. They can they can create a literally unlimited amount of money and QE and it will eventually find its way to the street and create inflation. I, I mean, they can they can they can create money faster than the private sector can create goods and services. So if you go Absolutely. with that classic Milton Friedman type definition, monetary phenomenon, right? Then they they you know the the money creation is so fast it's it's unbelievable if they want it to be, uh, and and the the product creation that can be fast. Technology speeds it up. Globalization makes it cheap. Sure, but. Not as fast as you can create money <laughs> or currency, Absolutely. I should say. Absolutely. Okay. Now, the big risk is that a lot of times the way the Fed, the central bank does things, it's not particularly efficient. So if they flood the economy with money, we're not necessarily going to see those effects the next day or the next week or even the next month. Sometimes it can, sometimes it can take, take months or years for us to see that that impact from the stuff that the Fed does because, again, it's not – particularly efficient. Um, and there are things that, that the Fed can do to make things more efficient, like giving money directly to to consumers. But typically, the way they do it is, is, is relatively inefficient, which means that we don't necessarily see the results of the Fed's actions in the short term. It normally takes months or even years for us to see the results. And for that reason, the Fed will often overcorrect. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They'll put out too much money and they won't realize it's too much money. Think of it as driving a car on a patch of ice. Mm-hmm. You'll turn the wheel, but until it, the, it the, the wheel's slowly. kind of Gotta catch. Yeah, till yeah. till the wheels catch, um, you're still moving in the wrong direction. Mm-hmm. And by the time the wheels do catch, you find that you've you, you've overcorrected. Right. And this is actually the reason. This is the biggest reason for economic cycles because the Federal Reserve is trying to control the economy. They're trying to keep the 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 economy as flat as possible. They don't want big peaks. They don't want big troughs. They want things relatively flat. But the problem is to do that, they often overcorrect or undercorrect, and that's what causes those big peaks. Sure. So certainly I think certainly I think there's a big there's a lot that the the Fed can do to kind of control inflation or deflation and keep us from from getting into a really really bad spot. Um, but if things get bad and and the Fed majorly overcorrects or undercorrects, um, we could end up in a situation where we're in a major currency crisis. And I know that there are a lot of people that are kind of concerned about over the next five or ten or twenty years. Are we going to see a major currency crisis with the U.S. dollar? When you print too much money, other countries start to lose faith in your currency. The reason we're able to print all this money is because there are all these other countries and all these other investors around the world who are willing to buy our debt. They're willing to finance that money printing because they look at us and they say, the U.S. dollar is the strongest, most stable, and most secure currency in the entire planet, maybe in the entire history of the world. We want to invest in this money because we know we're going to get our money out. We know it's not going to collapse. Yeah, and it's the reserve currency of the world, which exactly. is a, a, another way of saying that. Uh, right. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, um, and this this we could go off on a tangent forever, and we, we're not going to have time. So I'd yeah. love to have you back to talk about some of these things. But one of the parts of MMT, and I think MMT, modern monetary theory, is mostly a fantasy. But I, do, I will tell you, since the U.S., 
has so uh, so many loans out there in the entire world all of that debt has to be paid back in its own currency in dollars yep. right and since the irs is the biggest taxing agency in the world all of the taxes have to be paid in dollars and this is where the mmt people do make sense okay Absolutely. and 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 so it speaks to that the dollar it almost has to stay strong. It, well, not almost, it does until those debts are repaid and all those taxes are repaid. And if those debts aren't repaid and if those taxes are, aren't repaid and if uh, the dollar's reserve currency status is challenged in too much of a way, of course, people do their own things, China and, you know, Russia, they, you know, there's all these little things going on, but it's nothing major, right? Um, you know, the U.S. has aircraft carriers, and all kinds of things to keep their product, which is the dollar, that's their main product, the dollar, uh, the main the main product of any country is its currency, in my opinion, uh, to keep their product um, at the forefront of uh, of uh, utilization. Uh, I, yeah, and yeah. and absolutely, and I, I think that you yeah you stated that really well. Basically, uh, the U.S. dollar is the world's reserve currency for the foreseeable future, and it would be hard for that to change. That said, who if cares we, what Peter Schiff says? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think I, or Ray Dalio. Yeah, yeah, um, well, right, right, yeah. Cash I, is I, trash. I, Ray yeah. Dalio says cash is trash right when cash became king. <laughs> I mean, it's like he was so wrong about that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, yeah, I, and I, we should come, we should do a third episode oh, where yeah. we can talk all about this because absolutely. there's a lot of interesting yeah. topics here. But let, let's let's get through because I think a lot of people who are listening to this actually want to answer to the question of, yeah. so what should I be doing right. now? Please, um, yes. And, and so let's talk about what we should be doing now. What can we be doing to make money today? And again, I, this, this presentation was created before this pandemic. There may be some slight changes here, but essentially the whole purpose of this presentation was what should we be doing today to take advantage of a downturn or an economy that isn't as strong as it, as it previously right. was? So house flipping. Um, keep in mind, again, I wrote this a few months ago. Um, I don't necessarily think house flipping is the best, um, the best real estate niche to be in right now. It's very difficult. If you're doing transactional real estate, it can be very, very difficult to make money when values are dropping. Mm -hmm. Now, I know what everybody's thinking. If you're listening to this in the May timeframe, when this was recorded, uh, May 2000 timeframe, a lot of people are looking around 2020. Saying, oh my God, how, values are going up. Right. Yeah. Things aren't dropping. Right. Um, and that may be Which is odd in the middle of a pandemic that prices are rising, but yes. It is. Yeah. It is. But if you think about it, it makes sense. Yeah. Two big things happened um, in, in the real estate market due to this this pandemic. One, demand has has receded somewhat. People aren't out there buying as many houses so as they were. There are a lot why? of people that, yeah. that are locked in their houses right. and they're worried about what's going on and they're not out there buying houses. Number two, supply has receded. So there are a lot of house Way sellers down. or potential house yeah. sellers who are saying, I don't want people trancing through my house right now. I don't Can't want to have to set yeah. up for showings while I'm like working from home. Yeah. And don't don't bring your virus into my house. And don't yeah. bring your virus into my <laughs> yeah. house. So both supply and demand are constrained. But if you look at the data, supply seems to be more constrained than demand. There are more people out there that are mm -hmm. willing to go yeah. trounce through somebody else's house than there are people who are willing to allow people to trounce through their house. Right. Um, so we've seen a major constraint in supply, people listing fewer houses, sure. and we've seen a, a, a reasonable constraint in demand. Mm -hmm. Anytime you have a, a, tight, a, a more constraint in supply than you do in demand, prices are going to go up because you're, you have essentially more, more demand than supply. So it's not surprising right now that prices are holding steady or even rising and, and there, are, there are bidding wars in certain areas. Uh, it's simply a result of just very weird, inefficient real estate markets where supply and demand isn't isn't where it, it it needs to be or where it's supposed to be. I think what we're going to see in a few weeks or a few months is that a lot more people are going to start listing their houses. A lot more people are going to start going out and looking the, for houses. The spring selling season has been postponed to uh, the third quarter. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, and the big question is, when things shake out, when this market becomes efficient again, are we going to see more 
supply emerge? Are we going to see more sellers out there? Or are we going to see more demand emerge? Are there going to be more buyers out there? We don't really know the the answer because we don't know how this whole pandemic, both from a purely financial st- standpoint or from a psychological standpoint, has impacted buyers and sellers yeah. because we're only seeing a few of them right now. Once things open up again, we're going to get a better idea of how much actual supply there's going to be, how much actual demand there's going to be. And obviously, I mean, this this doesn't take a genius to, to say, but one of three things is going to happen. There's going to be more supply than there is demand and prices are going to drop. There's going to be more demand than there is supply and prices are going to go up. Or there's going to be about the same supply and demand and prices are going to stay flat. We don't know which of the three they are. So basically what I'm telling people who do transactional real estate, basically they buy and they sell. I would stay away from transactional real estate right now until we have a better idea of where that that supply and demand is going to shake out. So if you're a house flipper, one, the markets are staying strong right now. Any properties that you're working on flipping right now, get them on the market. Yeah. Um, we're, we're putting two properties on the market this weekend because we think we're probably, we, we rushed them through because we think this could be the best opportunity to sell that we're going to see in the next few months. Yeah. Um, If you're still buying flips, what I would recommend is keep those projects quick. I can say to you over the next two weeks or the next month, even the next couple months, we're not going to see a market crash in the real estate market. Real estate fundamentals are are actually pretty strong. And for us to see a major downturn in real estate, I think other parts of the economy would have to almost collapse. So I I think housing is relatively strong right, right. now. And and Jason, you're you're talking about the economic data, but let me talk to you, uh, you know, and and we we're going to have to do this in three parts uh, time yep. uh, time wise because I could talk to you for 3 days, no problem. Uh, and that that'd be great. I'd love it. Uh, but um you know, the other component of it is the psychological component and just the yep. lifestyle component. The home, the world has discovered that the home is the center of the universe. Yep. And people who are in the home improvement business, people who sell home furnishings, they're going to do great, uh, you know, uh, coming out of this because everybody now is making their home their castle. Yep. And and so uh, I think there are going to be for those who can afford it and uh, a lot of people suffering, too. So it's divided. But for those who can afford it, there's going to be move up buyers. They're going to want to get in a better home uh, and they're going to move out of high density areas to low density areas. I think we talked about that on part one. I'm not sure. Yep. Uh, but uh, but yeah, you know, because this isn't over. Folks, this this is this is going to be with us. The pandemic uh, is going to be with us a long time. And then after it's gone, vaccine, whatever, maybe just sort of naturally fades away like some of them do. uh, You still we're going to have a a post traumatic stress disorder that's going to last for many years, many years, maybe a generation. I mean, this is like how polio affected people when polio was a big thing, right? Uh, you know, this this is not going away anytime soon, psychologically, okay? So uh, the home is going to be the center of the universe. I'm very bullish on the home. So, yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. And, and I would say if I were still building right now, um, I'd be building houses that had dedicated office space for, mm-hmm. the, for the homeowners. And I'd a home build, gym. Too. And a home yeah. gym. Multiple big- office spaces for multiple occupants. Yeah. Yep, and a big pantry to yeah. store extra food yeah, and absolutely. extra drink. Good. So those are the types of things that, again, like you said, this could this could be a generational mm-hmm. change. Yeah, it is. Um, so if you are do if you if you are flipping, I would say keep projects quick. Um, I think it's safe to say that we're not going to see an economic collapse or a housing collapse anytime in the next two or three months. Whether we're going to see it in six, twelve, or eighteen months, that's a little bit more uh, undecided. We don't know. But if you're keeping projects really quick, if you're getting in and out, you're probably going to be pretty safe. Multiple exit strategies. Anytime you're going to buy a flip in this type of of market, make sure you have a, a backup or three backup exit strategies. Um, I'm still buying a couple flips, but all of the flips that I'm buying right now would make good long term rentals as well. Mm-hmm. Um, that's kind of my backup strategy yeah. if the flips don't work or if the market kind of falls and, and, out. And we don't have too many flippers in our audience, so yeah. you know, no need to dwell on this. But yeah, yeah go ahead. Okay. So w- let's talk about buy and hold. So th- this is the more interesting one because buy and hold is a great strategy any part of the market cycle. Um, if you're generating cash flow from from your assets, um, you're probably going to be generating cash flow um, at any 
point in the economic cycle, whether things are up or down. So absolutely, you can still buy rentals. One of the things I like to say, or a couple of things I like to say, if you're going to be buying rentals right now, is that even if you look back to 2008, which was a pretty bad real estate specific downturn, even in 2008, market rents weren't affected that much. In a lot of areas, uh, market rents were still pretty strong. In some areas, rents actually increased. In the worst areas, in the worst cases back in 2008, we saw about a 10% drop in market rents. And again, a lot of areas didn't even see that. But let's assume that, that we think that what's coming up could be as bad as 2008. If you think that, then you want to take some 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 precautions. And what I would say is, if you're buying buy and hold real estate right now, underwrite a little bit more conservatively. Assume that 10% drop in rents. Then if you don't see a drop in rents, great, you have more upside. Or when the market gets strong again and, 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 and prices start to rise and, and rents start to rise, if you've modeled in 10% drop in rents, you're just going to have that much better of, a, of an asset in a couple of years. Likewise with vacancies. A lot of markets in 2008 didn't see an increase in, in, in vacancies, a decrease in occupancies. But in some markets, we did see that. Certainly in certain classes of housing. Class A housing tended to see um, a greater increase in, in, in vacancy. Class B, to some degree, saw an increase in, in, in vacancy. Um, but class C properties, mobile homes, working class properties – basically saw an increase in occupancy because people need a place to live and they're moving from those class A and class B properties down into the the lower class that they can afford. That's the but, great thing about having rentals in the, uh, you know, below the median sales price in any given market. Absolutely. You know, you're going to catch people moving up into the housing market, uh, yep. you know, moving out of their parents' home, uh, you know, uh, maybe coupling up. Uh, they, they need a single family home, uh, et cetera, expanding families. But then you're going to catch people moving down the economic ladder, too, and you're going to be able to help them. Uh, maybe they came out of foreclosure. We saw this a lot during the Great Recession. They came out of foreclosure, recycled it into the market as a renter. And uh, yeah, it's great. It's a great place yeah. to be. You got to be in the right segment of the market yeah, and exactly. the right right market in general. But yes, yep. absolutely. Yep. So if you're buying buy and hold right now, just be a little bit more conservative in your underwriting. Assume a, a, a modest drop in rents. Assume a, a modest increase in vacancies. If the numbers still work. Right absolutely go ahead and buy. And then I would also say, be aware of, like we were discussing, what class of housing you're buying. Focus on those B minus, C plus, even C class properties. Mobile homes are great at this point in the market cycle. I know a lot of people That's, that's who, the last thing before the street. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And 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 obviously people don't want to be homeless, so right. so they're going to go somewhere. So if you're a buy and hold investor, focus on those those lower class properties right now and be more conservative in your underwriting. Um, if you're a lender, uh, yeah. So I, I assume you probably don't have a ton of lenders in 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 your your audience, but yes, you can always still lend. Realize that uh, interest rates are a reflection of risk, and if you th uh, if you think your risks are going up because of what's going on in the economy, raise your rates. Um, I still do some lending. I have moved away from lending to house flippers. I'm lending to buy and hold investors um, because I know. Tell, that tell me about the terms you're lending to buy and hold investors. That's interesting because I I do both. I'm a hard money lender. Uh, but on the long, you, you just can't even come close to competing with the government subsidized Fannie Freddie. I mean, you're just, that's like not even in the discussion, yeah. uh, not even close. But what, so, what, what are your terms on a long term loan? So I'm not doing long term loans. So all of my <clears throat> all of my lending is to I guess the popular term these days is the Burr investors. Right. Um, those investors that are buying uh, the buy and holds. They're so renovating. When them, you say it. buy and hold, it's someone who's doing the fix and flip themselves, but they're keeping it. They're flipping exactly. it to themselves essentially. Okay, so it's not a long term loan then. Yeah, yeah, no, because tip. Typically, yeah. I do twelve months. Got it. Um, That's a hard money loan. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, with the intent, with the intention of they're going to refinance with a sure. with either a GSE or a portfolio lender at the yeah. end of that twelve months. Right. Once the property has been renovated and they have a, a long term tenant in there. Um, but the reason I like this is be, if in twelve months um, they can't refinance because the lending market has tightened up or their their property has lost value. I don't care. I'm happy to extend that loan yeah. because they're generating cash every month. You they charge them for an extension? 
I, I typically don't. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's one of the, that's one of my kind of, uh, uh, um, benefits of, of when, when I work with somebody, I won't lend on any property that I wouldn't be happy to own. Yeah. Um, so in a worst case scenario, if I have to take over a property, I'm, I'm probably pretty happy about it. Obviously I'm not happy for the, the borrower, but, but I'm happy for me. Um, but I tend to tell my borrowers, look, if you can't refinance in 12 months through no fault of your own, um, I'm going to extend the loan at the same terms. I might even improve the terms if it's through no fault of their own, um, because I really want them to feel comfortable, um, knowing that it's a partnership. And if I'm collecting uh, uh, on, on a loan for the next three or four years until the market improves, I'm fine with that, um, as long as I'm collecting every month. Yep. Okay. Um, and then I would also say if you're a lender, know your foreclosure laws. Um, in some states, yeah. you can you can foreclose in 60 or 90 days. And um, you if, if you see the market starting to drop and you're, you're – Borrowers aren't paying. Um, you can get that property back and 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 disperse it pretty quickly. Um, in other states, it could take twelve or eighteen or twenty four months to to foreclose on a property. Um, in those markets, uh, you're at a lot more risk because you're you're spending twelve or eighteen or twenty four months not collecting income, and by the time you actually get that foreclosure judgment, it's possible the market has dropped even more. Yeah, so. it, being a lender is is not a <laughs> an easy game. Yeah, <laughs> you no. know, uh, I'd, I'd much rather. Uh, <laughs> fight for to get my house back as a rental with a bad tenant than I would to try and foreclose and collect from a uh, uh, a borrower. But you know, it's it's not bad. It's just not as good as owning the owning the physical asset is the best deal. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Agreed. Um, commercial. If you're in the commercial space, yes, you can still buy commercial. In fact, there's certain. Uh, certain specific asset classes within commercial that tend to do very well um, in a downturn. Mobile home parks, we talked about that. Now, here are the next two. Remember, I wrote this back in, uh, in last year, and I've been presenting this through the beginning yeah, of the pandemic. I, I was about to start debating with you, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Historically. And I own a mobile home park, and that's great. Yeah, but yeah, yep. go ahead with the next two. Yeah. Historically, self storage has done very well during mm-hmm. downturns when people have yeah. to, to when people start losing their jobs or yeah. seeing their wages cut uh, they move into smaller housing or lower mm-hmm. class housing um, which means they don't have as much room for their stuff but right. people don't like getting rid of their stuff yeah. so typically during during uh, times of housing turmoil self storage does really well because people just put their stuff in there until they they think that they're going to move up to a bigger house again um this time around, self storage has done. I, I kind of wonder how it's going to do this time. I'm I'm wondering it, if that same set of assumptions is going to hold true, and I just don't know. But yeah, yeah. it very well may not. Yeah. So um, certainly over the last couple months, we haven't seen self storage do very well. People haven't been moving. Mm-hmm. Um, people have just kind of been hunkering down. Um, and then college rentals is another one. Historically, again, historically, um, during times of economic turmoil, a lot of people lose their jobs. They go back to school. Mm-hmm. Um, because they see it as an opportunity to to get uh, more qualifications, get a better job later. Right. That's the old um, world. But what about now? And, and so <laughs> now um, we're not necessarily seeing people go back to school. The ones that are going back to school are doing it online. A lot of schools yeah. don't have uh, in-person classes, obviously, for the end of this year. But a lot of them have said they're not going to have in-person classes for the first semester of next year. I, I think, so, Jason, I think the college market is going to be I agree. Uh, it's going to be bad. Yeah. And uh, it's going to be like the Airbnb market is. And, yep. um, and and what's interesting about it is, and this is great for society, you know, the, the college debt enslavement complex is, this is the nail in the coffin, if you ask yep. me. I think, yep. I think everybody's realized they don't, you know, they, first of all, if they can't have a college experience, they're not going to con their parents into paying 50 grand a year. OK, yeah. uh, and, you know, and 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 taking college online is not a college experience. OK, yeah. so that's the first thing, you know, you don't get drunk enough. You don't get you know, you don't get enough romantic uh, relationships <laughs> uh, for lack of a better term. But you know what I mean? Yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, uh, so so, you know, people aren't going to pay that much for it. And college prices are going to plummet. And it's a great thing. It's as it should be. And absolutely. and and then what's interesting is all of these college, you know, the, these disgusting universities are like they're basically just big hedge funds okay they're 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 the biggest real estate investor in any town they're in right and 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 their real estate is going to collapse yep. and they're going to convert 
those dormitories and 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 even their campus buildings to alternate uses. They've got to because Absolutely. they're just not going to be used that much. Yeah, college will still exist. I'm not saying it's going to go away completely, but it's going to decline precipitously. And uh, when that happens, these uh, they're going to be looking for alternate uses. And these may become like really, really super low income housing, you know, dormitories and stuff like that. Maybe government contracts for homeless people. I don't know. But there it's it's going to change. And we're already seeing how the college towns, their businesses are suffering so much because they're ghost towns. You know, yep. so uh, it's it's a really interesting dynamic. And the college rental concept, by the way, what Jason is saying, if you didn't kind of catch it, is that usually those command a higher rent to value ratio than normal because, you know, the, the students, uh, you know, they can rent them out as individual bedrooms and do all kinds of things to increase rent similar to the Airbnb world where you can get a higher than market rent uh, many times because it's just sort of a special asset class. But again, I, I think that's really going to change. And I think you agree, right, Jason? A hundred percent. And I think, uh, again, if we do a part three here, uh, an interesting discussion will be what's going to happen. We have to do a part eight. Okay. (laughs) Yes. I I think college debt is going to, uh, uh, student loan debt is going to, uh, to play a big role in the next, uh, economic shift and, and what happens with that shift. Um, so, so yeah, well, we can talk about that more in in the next part. And and, and you didn't say retail and office space. And obviously I think those are, you know, looking pretty pretty, pretty grim, right? Yeah. Yeah. So obviously office space could be the, the big loser in all of this. Um, I mean, we already have companies like uh, Twitter who are saying their employees never, ever, ever have to come back to the office. Um, they can work from home for, for the rest of their careers if they want. Um, there are going to be a lot of other companies that follow suit. Yep. Um, and, um, I think another, I think the hospitality, the hotel industry, the restaurant industry is, is going to be a a casualty here, not just because, um, people aren't traveling as much, but what a lot of people don't realize is a large portion of, of hotel income and restaurant income is based on business travelers. Right. And um, business travel is likely to take a, make a major slowdown. Now the businesses realize that between Skype and Zoom and, right. and all this other technology, to yeah. they don't need to travel yeah. as much. So I, th- I think hotels are going to uh, take a, a, a major uh, a major turn. Now there could yeah, be some opportunities. And if it, if it, this is what I was just going to say. You know, the alternate use of those hotel properties now, other yeah. resort properties. You know, it depends on the type, but they may not fare so well. But the the hotels are now we're looking at a deal right now as we speak uh, to convert a hotel to low income housing. Yep. And um, uh, the city's OK with it. And, uh, uh, you know, that the hotel's selling, though, at a much lower than hotel multiple. Yep. Uh, you know, the the they're, they're, the prices are collapsing of those asset yep. classes because, you know, as at low income housing, you just can't get the income out of it that you can renting nightly uh, as a hotel. So, yeah, it's a lot of exactly. changes, a lot of changes. Exactly. I think a lot of them are going to be used for assisted living facilities as well. Yeah. So um, if you're if you're one of those more risky investors who's willing to take a chance and, and do a big deal, um, there could be a lot of big opportunities with, with hotels that get repurposed um, in the commercial space. There are some other things that tend to do pretty well in commercial. Um, uh, retail obviously could take a big hit. Oh, yeah. um, Already has been. Already yeah. has. But there, there are certain parts of retail that people still have a high demand for, for example, grocery. Mm-hmm. So if you're going to, if you can pick up a really cheap strip center mm-hmm. that is anchored by a grocery store, mm-hmm. well, people are still going to go out and get their groceries. Right. Although you could argue that with, with things like uh, grocery delivery yeah. and Instacart, um, that may even be changing in the near future. Right. Um, but, but, uh, retail backed uh, or retail anchored uh, grocery anchored retail is still a pretty safe play and medical centers medical mm-hmm. centers tend to do very well during a downturn will probably continue to do well during this downturn um, so there are some opportunities in commercial especially if you're smart and you're willing to repurpose or or, or think creatively 